You know that we are working our way through the book of Galatians, um, God's grace for saints. And uh, this morning, um, we want to talk a little bit about the gospel of brotherhood, the good news of how um, the gospel of Jesus Christ has impacted our, our very relationships with uh, each other and how we are called uh, by God uh, to care for uh, each other. Um, we want the Holy Spirit to be the one who is controlling our life uh, together. And so uh, let's um, look at uh, Galatians, again, chapter 5, verse 26. Um, well, I'll read 25 through verse 5 of chapter 6. Please hear God's word. Galatians 5, 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Um, God bless the reading of his word. <clears throat> As you know, uh, last week we, uh, we did talk about uh, what it means to walk by the Spirit or be led or filled uh, by the Spirit or with the Spirit. And it is, as you know, it is the power to love and the power to serve uh, other people the same way you want to be loved yourself. We see that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 uh, through, through 15. It is the power uh, to, to treat people the same way you want to be treated. It's like Jesus said, that, that is the law and the prophets, to do unto other people what you would have them do unto you. That's what it means to live like a Christian. And it is the power to count other people, as, as it was read today, to count other people more significant than yourself. To look out for the interest of other people and not simply your own interest. It's so easy and so natural to be self-centered and to be self-absorbed and to think about what about me, what about me, and what about my this and my that. But to really be filled with the Spirit is, is to be empowered to serve other people above yourself. And, um, of course... Uh, we, we saw in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 21, uh, the motivation, the foundation uh, to living that way, uh, the Bible says, is um, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. And, and, and what Jesus Christ has done for you and I, uh, His service to us, His laying down His life for us, and and giving himself up for you, and, and giving himself up for our sin, and, and being cursed by God in, instead of you getting cursed, right? And, and, and becoming sin on the cross so that you might become the righteousness of God. Uh, what, what Christ has done should, should leave us standing there with our mouths wide open in praise and worship, overwhelmed with the beauty of God's service towards us, and fully motivated because of that to turn to someone else and say, how can I be of service to you? It says, out of reverence for Christ, submit to one another. And, and the word reverence uh, is, um, 
It is uh, it's a good example of it found in Psalm 130. Uh, Psalm 130, um, out of fear of Christ is, is what it literally says. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're afraid of him, although that wouldn't be an unwise thing. Uh, but in Psalm 130, verses 3 and verses 4, it says this, uh, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If God was going to remember all of our sins, who would be able to stand before him? Nobody would be able to. But he says, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. With you there's forgiveness, there's grace, there's mercy, there's forgiveness so that you might be feared. That God forgives us so that we would, we would stand in awe of him and we would, we would worship him and we would, be, we would be completely people who simply can't get over the fact that God has served us so well in Christ Jesus that we are, we are fixated on, on the beauty of Christ and on the service of Christ so that when we look at our brothers and sisters in the Lord and even people outside of the body of Christ, our first response would be, how can I be of service to you? What can I do for you? Instead of saying, what can you do for me? Um, so so that's, that's something that we, we grow in in a daily basis, right? It's, it's, not, it's not our knee-jerk response often. We often are wondering about ourselves and what's in it for us. But, but it's, it's, in, it's in fixating on Jesus that we learn that um, all of our needs are provided for in Christ Jesus. You seek the kingdom and the righteousness of God first. Everything else he will provide for you. It's all included. In the package, and um, if you seek God's kingdom, God will He'll take care of you. And um, so you don't have to worry about what about me and what about tomorrow and what about what are we going to eat and what are we going to wear. It's all taken care of. Just seek God's kingdom first. And so we see in verse 26 of chapter 5 in Galatians that uh, one of the key enemies of living this way, living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, uh, is is conceit is conceited, self-glory. It's, it's, looking at, it's looking too, spending too much time looking in the mirror. You know, it, it's, it's conceit. It's glorying in ourself and, and we're, we, we can't get over ourself. That's, that's just the opposite of being filled with the Spirit is being filled with ourself. And uh, conceit uh, demonstrates itself in two ways. It says provoking one another, envying one another. Provoking is a word for challenging people. It means that you have a superiority complex and you think you're better than other people and you challenge people to prove to them that you are better than they are. That's just the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. Is that you're so full of yourself that you, you, you go out of your way to prove to people that I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm wiser than you. I'm stronger than you. Whatever it is. I'm more intellectually sound than you. I'm more insightful than you. And so, you know, we do this in subtle ways. Um, the, other, the other way uh, is to have an inferiority complex, is to envy people, to say everybody else is better than I am, and I'm, I'm just a nobody, and, and I'm mad about that. And, and both of these things filter into this conceit. You know, we, it's all about us and all about me. And, and, and see, this is the problem. It's just the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. And it leaves us with um, the type of attitude that we just were unable to serve other people. We're just incapable of doing it because we're always looking for who am I better than? Who am I worse than? And I'm jealous of and I've got to get better than so I can say I'm better than everybody. And so um, it, it leaves us totally incapable of serving other people. It, it's the king of the hill scenario. You know, we played this game when I was a kid. You know, you get up on the top of the hill and you're the king of the hill. And then someone comes, comes up and runs and knocks you off the hill and says, I'm the king of the hill. And so it just becomes a, a competing match uh, your whole life. It's, it's who's going to be on the top of the hill. And we need to realize that there's only one hill and it's heaven and Jesus is on the top and you can't knock him off. So just forget about it. Um, we're all called to be servants. And uh, we don't, we're not here to challenge uh, one another um, this was, this was Cain's problem. You know, he looked at his brother, he wanted to be better, he realized he wasn't, and he was jealous, he was mad, and so it led him to destroy his brother. And see, this is what uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, 
uh, verse uh, 15, again the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. If we bite and devour one another, we will eventually be consumed or destroyed by each other. And so um, rather than, than seeing life that way, uh, we, we, are, we are in a body together. We belong to one another. We are members of one another. Uh, I can only rise as high as you rise. And right, it's, it's, you know, the three musketeers even knew this, right? I mean, all for one and one for all, remember? Uh, that's the way we're supposed to live in the body of, if the three musketeers can get it right, come on, you know. Uh, we're the body of Christ. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, God lives in us and we're, we're members of one another. And, and we are to care for each other as we're in the same body. Now, it, you know, I often use this illustration when, when, when people get married. You know, it would be, maybe it wouldn't be, but perhaps it would be a, a learning lesson if, if people got married. And as soon as, as soon as they said, I do, and the minister pronounced them one, that all of a sudden the light from heaven would come and flash on them, and there would be a big puff of smoke, and there would only be one person sit, standing there. <laughs> and it would be so easy to realize that we're one body now, because we're only one. We're like stuck to each other. But that's not the way it happens. There's still two people standing there, but they're to learn on a daily basis what it means to function as one person. And, and it's the same in the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. He's the only one in charge. And we're the body, and we're supposed to function under his headship, and we're supposed to function as members of one another. We belong to one another. It, some, we, you know, you're, you're a brother from a different mother, right? Uh, you're, you're a sister from a different mother, right? We've got the same father. We've got the same bridegroom. Uh, we're, we're all one bride. We're all part of this together, and we've got to function as one, as, one, as one person. And so we've got to love and care for, for each other. Um, and so we have, to, we have to bear one another's burdens. And, and in the end, uh, we've, got to bear our own, we've got to bear our own burden. It's, it's actually a different word in the Greek. Uh, the word load and the word burden are two different words. The word burden is something that's entirely too big for one person to carry. And it's the picture of someone trying to drag a huge weight up a hill. They can't do it. They're exhausted. And someone else has to come along and pick it up, and they can now move the weight. Um, the other one is a load. It's like a backpack. It's something that only you can carry, and it can only fit on your shoulders. It's too small to fit on two people's shoulders. So you've got a, that's your load. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, Lord willing. Um, but we're, we're told particularly, um, brothers, notice how he begins this chapter. Brothers, he ends it almost the same way. Uh, the... the Besides the amen at the end of chapter 6, brothers is the last word. This is a book in brothers. And so he's saying that we, we are brothers, um, sisters, we're, we're together. And, and the thing he identifies particularly is if anyone is caught in any transgression, um, if we're caught in a transgression, you know, in this life, oftentimes we get caught. We all do get caught. In, in some kind of transgression, none of us are spiritually perfect. And uh, we're weak, um, often fall into some kind of wickedness. And what he's teaching us is that we need to be watched. We need someone to watch over us. Cain asked a question a long time ago. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, here's the answer. Yes, you are. Uh, you are your brother's keeper. You're your sister's keeper. And um, it implies that we need oversight. Uh, if you... Listen to this passage. You can turn to it if you'd like. But Hebrews chapter 3, often quoted. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, uh, speaking to the whole church, he says, Take care, brothers, same word, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. He's not talking to you individual. Check out your own heart. He's saying, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, lest anyone be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have come to share in Christ if we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And so, the, so one of the things that we do in the body of Christ is that we see to it that people hold their original confidence in Jesus Christ firm to the end. One time, uh, a pastor's job was, was portrayed as, as someone who, who could help you die well. They could help you die well. 
They didn't kill people, but they just, they watched over people's souls so that when they leave this earth and they stand before God, they can do that well. They didn't have to be ashamed in the presence of God. Remember, remember, remember what, what the Apostle Paul said? He said, I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous Lord will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who love his appearing. And so part of the goal in the body of Christ, that we're, one of the things that we're supposed to do, what it means to be that we're a brotherhood, is that we watch over people. We watch over one another's spiritual life. You know, sometimes we, we, get the, we get the idea that, well, that's, you know, we see someone caught in a transgression, and we say, well, that's really none of my business. I don't want to really get involved. Uh, it is your business, right? You're in the body of Christ. We're members of one another. L- let me give you an example. If you're, if you're getting out of an elevator, right, and your hand gets caught in a door, is that your business? You're right, you're, it's, it's your body, right? It's your hand. Okay, you're in the body of Christ. One of the hands got caught in the elevator door. Is it, it, it is your business, right? If you trip, it's not just your foot's business, it's your whole body's business, right? Because you're going to fall on your face if you don't readjust your steps. And so, so as, as, a, as a member in the body of Christ, uh, we're, we're called to make sure that, that we all finish this race right and finish this race and receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of God. And... Um, so it says, if, you, if anyone is caught in a transgression, um, we, are, we are required uh, to restore that person, to put them back where they were before, uh, to restore that person. That, that's, that's your calling as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not just the calling of a pastor, it's the calling of the people of God. It says brothers, not pastors. It says brothers, you who believe. But then... Um, as you know, uh, it, 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 it focuses on a particular type of person, which I'm arguing that we all should mature to become, a particular type of person with a particular type of attitude. And um, it's not the easiest thing to do. It requires a certain personality. And, and it, it, says, it says, you who are spiritual, you who are spiritual, and um, it's, it's, it's focusing on those who, who, in the body of Christ, are loyal to the Lord and love other people. Um, because sometimes, you know, when people get caught in a transgression, what, what is sometimes our knee-jerk response? Well, serves them right, you know. They made their bed, let them sleep in it. You know, it's not my problem. It is your problem. They're a member of the body of Christ. They belong to you. You're members of one another. We... We get our pronouns wrong. You know, we ask people a question, how are you doing? Well, they're a member of the body of Christ, right? How are we doing? Right? Sounds a little funny, doesn't it? Sounds a little weird, but it, it is, it's, more, it's more biblical. How are we doing? What are we doing today? <laughs> say that to someone next time. You say, we ain't doing nothing. You know, you can do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. You know, we live in a society that's so individualistic. If this is my house. This is my picket fence. This is my automobile. Well, what about the body of Christ? You know? What about what's yours is yours and what's, what's yours is mine? <laughs> right? Um, no, that's not the way. But it, it is that way, right? It's, we, we belong to one another. We're members of one another. Uh, we should have equal care for one another. Everybody is important in the body of Christ. There's no big eyes and small, small U's. Everybody is equally important. Um, and so, so, so the, the goal here is that if someone is caught in a transgression, um, you who are spiritual, uh, people who, who when they see an individual in trouble, this is what it means to be spiritual. You see someone in trouble. You see someone caught in a transgression. You don't see someone caught in a transgression. You see yourself caught in a transgression. Remember the Good Samaritan? When he saw that guy laying on the road, he saw himself laying on the road. And that's why he was able to love his neighbor the same way he loved himself. Because he had bought, you know, hook, line, and sinker, 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 sinker. It's sinker. Uh, He had bought completely the reality. Don't worry about my grammar. I mess up all the time. Just think, just remember. He, He had bought completely the reality that he belonged to this person. You're a member of this person. 
And so, so, so when someone's suffering in the body of Christ, remember 1 Corinthians 12, everybody's suffering in the body of Christ, right? When someone's rejoicing, everyone's rejoicing. And, and if we start looking at it and saying, well, I'm, I'm, they got blessed and I'm, I'm jealous, you know, you shouldn't be, why should you be jealous? Their blessing is your blessing, right? Everybody is in this together. And so when, when someone, God blesses one person, the whole body benefits. When someone is suffering, the whole body is, is sympathetic and should be suffering as, along with this, this individual. This is why sometimes a church is so uh, a poor a witness in, in the world that we live in because we're so individualized. We're so separated and segmented from one another and we don't really live our lives in communion with one another um, realizing that we're members of the same body. And a specific characteristic um, that, that is um, um, highlighted if you look at verse, verse 1 is... is gentleness. Gentleness is, is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, you know, gentleness. And it's also the same word that's used when Jesus says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. Meek is the word gentleness. I'm gentle and humble in heart. Um, and uh, Jesus at that point is seeking to restore humanity to himself. And so his gentleness and his humility come to fruition on Calvary. And so, so when you see someone caught in a transgression, you and I should think, first of all, well, well once we were caught in transgression, and, and, and what did Jesus do when he, when he saw us caught in transgression? He didn't say, well, that's their problem, or he didn't say they made their bed, let them sleep in it. He, he got off his throne, and he came to this world. He laid down his life on the cross. He was buried in the tomb, and he rose again so that we might not be caught in transgression, that we will be brought into his family. And so, so when you and I see people caught in transgression, the first thing that should move us is the gentleness of Jesus Christ for us. We should, re, we should, re, we should already be thinking about Christ, and so we should be re, reminded of how gentle and how compassionately Jesus handled our case. And we don't come to people holier than thou, thinking we're better and saying, how could you do this? You know, what's wrong with you? Don't you know better than this? We come saying, you know, I'm, I'm really no better than you are, you know. Uh, it's the grace of God that has kept me from falling this way, and it's the grace of God that actually brought me from this very same place. And, and um, we, we need to remember, we need to be reminded of our own uh, past failures. You know, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, uh, verse 22 and 43, one of, the, one of the indictments that God has against his people who fall into idolatry is that they forgot that they once were idolaters before they met him. They forgot where God brought them from, and that's why they fell. And um, they got over, see, they got over the fact that God had delivered them. And we're to be people who never get over the fact that God delivered us. You ever been in love before? You remember how it was, the warm fuzzies, the, you know, the twinkle in your eye? You were on cloud nine just walking around. You young people are too young for this. Uh, but, but you know what I'm saying. And, 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 and that's the way it is with God. There was, there was a time when we had that honeymoon stage with the Lord, right? You first were saved and you were telling everybody. You didn't even know these people. You were just talking to them about Jesus, you know. And... Um, and, and you were just so overwhelmed, and we need, to, we need to daily remind ourselves, we need to daily preach the gospel to ourselves to restore that, 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 that beauty and the joy of knowing Christ Jesus personally. And, um, and so the specific um, characteristic is gentleness. We're to be gentle people. And um, there's a lot of things you could say to people when they're caught in transgression. Um, I don't know whether you, you've bought yet the fact that we're responsible. And, and when you see someone caught in sin, you don't come as the sin police and beat them over the head and, and duct tape them to the wall and start hitting them. You know, you, you, what you do is that you come with gentleness. You come with the heart of Jesus Christ and say, can we talk about this? Can we, can we do lunch one day? Can we, can, we work, can we look at the scriptures together? And you seek to restore them, to put them back in order. Um, and one reason we, we exercise this gentle and humble spirit is because of what it says um, uh, in, in uh, the end of verse 1. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. 
Because if we come as if, oh, this will never happen to me. You know, sometimes I hear Christians say that I'll never do that. Be careful. <laughs> You're setting yourself up for failure. I tell people all the time, I'm, 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 I'm capable of doing anything wrong, and I'm guilty of doing everything wrong. The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who can know it? If you've broken one commandment, you've broken them all. That's what James says in chapter 2, verse 10. And so, so you're capable of anything under the sun. And, and that's, that's what's going to keep you close to Christ. If you go around thinking, well, I'll never do this, I'll never do that, you, you're setting yourself up. You're setting yourself up for failure. You're making yourself a target for the devil. Instead of realizing that, that everyone is sinful, everybody's a transgressor, everybody is perverted apart from Jesus Christ. And we need Jesus Christ on a daily basis to walk with us. We need to walk with one another on a daily basis. That's the point of Hebrews 3. Is that you and I need daily exhortation to stick with Jesus. We won't do it without that. Um, we are called to bear one another's burdens. Um, this is what it means, it says in verse 2, to fulfill the law of Christ. This is what it means to be a Christian. It means to be a burden bearer. Um, this is the very thing Christ Jesus did. When he saw you in your sin, he came down and he bore your burden. He bore all of your burden. You couldn't bear the burden. But now he calls you to imitate him, to mimic him by the power of the Spirit, to bear one another's burdens. And so we're to be in one another's lives, caring for one another, loving one another. You know, when, when, when you interact with each other when we interact with one another do we ever ask that question how is your walk with the Lord how is your loving are you loving God are you loving people the way God calls you are you and I as joyful in the Lord as we should be are you making peace with people who have problems with you are you being kind the way you and I are called to be kind you know are we being gentle are we showing the goodness of God are we being faithful to God? How's your self-control? How's your computer activity? You know, these are the type of questions that the body asks, you know. These are the type of, of heart-searching questions that we're to ask, not as police, but out of love for your brother and sister. Genuine love to see people walk by the Spirit and finish the race well. Um, it is your business. It would, it's what it means, it says, to fulfill the law of Christ. It means to pursue your brothers and sisters in the Lord, to see to it, and, and to be pursued. You know, we often don't have so much of a problem pursuing people, but, but being pursued, being, being able to be asked questions. You know, sometimes we have burdens in our life and struggles in our life, and we say, well, it's, it's just my problem. I don't, want to, I don't want to bother or burden anybody. You know, you're supposed to bother and burden people. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. And it takes humility. It takes a realization that your righteousness is really in heaven. That you're already accepted. You're already loved by the best. God loves you. Christ died for you. You know, nothing else tops that. This is not going to change your relationship with God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And so you and I are called to be open, honest, and transparent with one another. Appropriately, of course. But we're, we're to have people in our lives who can ask us hard questions. And um, questions that kind of make you squirm sometimes. Sometimes people will say, well, you, you know, your Bible says you're not supposed to judge people. Well, read the whole passage, right? It says, judge not lest you be judged. It says, get the mote out of your own eye first. Then you will see clearly how to remove the beam in your brother's eye. And so, yeah, we've got to do homework on ourselves. But that requires other people looking into our lives and saying, you know, how are you doing in this particular area? Where are your struggles spiritually? Do you have anybody in your life where you can really open up with like that and say, this is where I'm struggling spiritually. Would you pray for me? Do you have any insight from God's word? Would you help me walk this race so I can run this race so I can finish it well? And you and I need people in our life like that. If we don't have that, we're, what does it say? You know, it says that we, we are put, setting ourselves up for failure. Because you're, you're a member. You're not the body. You're a member of the body. And you by yourself cannot run this race. It's impossible. Put a foot on the track line and tell it to run the race. It's not going to work. It needs a leg. It needs a knee. It needs, a upper, it needs a hip. It needs, it needs the whole body to run. 
And so you and I need the whole body as well. We are all in this together and we are responsible. And um, uh, if, and, and see, look at, look at verse 3. This is the, this is, you know, if you don't want to do this, you know, you may be sitting and saying, I really don't want to do this. It's too uncomfortable. Um, and this is what verse 3 says to that attitude. For if anyone thinks he's something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. Because, see, the only attitude that would lead you away from that sort of lifestyle is the attitude of superiority. I'm above that. I don't need to get involved in stuff like that. They live their life, I live my life. That's the way it is. And the Bible says you're deceiving yourself. Because you're living, you're living in a body, but you're trying to live like you're not in a body. Um, and so, so Jesus says it like this. You've heard this many times. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. And so Jesus is in the business of gathering people, gathering his people together. And so that they're strong in the Lord. They're living in a life of love. They're fulfilling the law of Christ. They're, they're seeing to it that they're walking by the Spirit. They're going to finish the race well. And that's the group of people he can use beyond this place in the world to make a name for himself and to, and to, to fulfill the mission of God in, in advancing his kingdom in the world. Because we exist... Uh, for, the, for the people outside of these walls, right? We, we, we're the mission of God, you know, I, I think I said last week, someone put it this way, God has a church in this world for his mission. He has put you here in this world for his mission of advancing his name throughout the world uh, for the nations. So, so don't be deceived. It is your business. It is your problem. When, when, when I'm caught in a transgression, it's your business. When you're caught in a transgression, it's my business. Not just because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a brother, right? It doesn't say pastor, it says brothers. It's your business when people are caught. And, and, and you and I, you know, all of us are, are, are weak and we're all inferior in, in spiritually without Christ. And we need, we need to be in one another's lives to that end. Um, keep thinking about the image of you getting your hand caught in the elevator. The rest of your body just doesn't walk away, Right? You stop. You try to pull that door down to get that hand out of that elevator, right? And, and that's the way you and I have to see our brothers and sisters is that they're caught in the elevator door. And guess what? I'm attached to them. They go down. I go down. That's the way we have to think. You know, if the firefighters can think that way, right? If the army can think that way, we're the army of the Lord. We've got the spirit of God, right? <laughs> All right. We'll deal with it again next week. Okay, we have to bear our own burden at the end of the day. I've got to finish up. Um, instead, of challenging, uh, instead of challenging one another, uh, let each one test his own work. And, and what, it, what is it talking about in verses 4 and 5? It's saying that, that when, we, when, we, when we live this life of, of caring for one another and, and being spiritual and, 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 and watching over other people and seeing who's caught in a transgression and going to see to it that they get restored and they get to be walking with the Spirit again so that they can finish the race well. That's the type of life we're called to live because, because that's the type of life we're eventually going to answer for in the end. That's your particular load. Did you live that kind of life? That's one of the things that you and I will answer for on the day of judgment when we, when we stand before God is did you live that way towards your brothers and sisters or were you kind of in it for yourself and they were in it for themselves and you really didn't care about people or love people? Uh, you and I are going to, um, we're going to, have to, we're going to have to answer one day for the way we live our life. And, um, and, and our goal is, is to, you know, what's the motivation? It's Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus left heaven to see to it that the image of God uh, would be restored inside of you. And so, so we, in partnership with him, by the power of the Spirit, when we see someone caught in the elevator door, see someone caught in a transgression, we're committed to that person in the body of Christ or those persons, those people in the body of Christ because we want to see them walking with God, walking in the Spirit, and we want to see the image of God restored in them. And that's got to be our goal. That has to be our priority. But so often we're so caught up on our own priorities. What's important to you? And the thing that we should be most passionate about is, is becoming more like Jesus Christ in our character and in the way we live our life on a daily basis. And then we should be seeking to examine each other um, and see how we're doing. Um, a chief responsibility we have once we are saved 
is to love others, beginning with the body of Christ, and beyond that, to the world. Uh, Jesus gave us a mission, and because of him, um, would, you, uh, would you just take a moment, um, and uh, because, of, because of what Jesus has done for you, would you take a moment in community prayer, just to pray that, that you would be, that we would be spiritual, loving people, that we would be gentle as we handle people very delicately. And we'd be open and transparent and willing to share and willing to grow and willing to see people restored and finished a race well. Would you pray for that? And I'll close after a period of time.